Hi, I'm Chris from Sailing Vessel Navigator in the West Indies. Welcome to Going Further in Celestial Navigation. In this video series, we'll take a look at what you already know and build upon it to the point where you can fix your position any time of day using the sun. Before we go too much further though, let's take a couple minutes to review what we already know. At this point, you should be very familiar with the marine sextant itself and using it to measure objects in the sky, as well as correcting those measurements for index error, which is the error in the sextant, and using the nautical almanac to correct for dip, which is your height of eye correction, and main correction, which accounts for the atmospheric refraction and the thickness of the object. You should also be very good at interpolating figures in the nautical almanac. We've also covered the concept of geographic position, or the spot on Earth directly beneath any celestial object. This spot moves as the Earth rotates, and it's defined by its declination, or its distance north or south of the equator, and its Greenwich hour angle, or distance west and only west of the Greenwich meridian. We've also learned about local hour angle and how that relates Greenwich, you, and the body to each other. When we learned about the noon site, we covered the concept of zenith distance, which will be very important going forward. Remember that when we use the sextant to measure an angle between an object and the horizon, we're actually using that as a proxy for the angle between the object and the spot directly over your head, or your zenith. In the big picture going forward, what we're after is a circle of equal altitude. What this means is that if you knew the geographic position and height of an object, say a lighthouse, you can easily determine zenith distance and therefore your distance from the object. The actual figure would be your zenith distance times 60. If you were to do this for a lighthouse, it would plot as a circle of equal distance or range, where the circle represents every possible position you could be in based on your measurements. One measurement yields one circle of position, or a circle of equal altitude. The problem is, when we deal with the lighthouses in the sky, the circles are huge. And even if we tried, we couldn't plot the line of position on a chart with a scale appropriate enough for us to actually use. So we've got a few techniques we'll learn to work around this issue, but never lose sight of the big picture that we're looking for circles of equal altitude. Some of this might seem a bit heavy, but don't sell yourself short. In fact, with what you already know, I bet you can go farther than you think. Even with the knowledge of the noon site for latitude or the Polaris site at night will enable you to safely cross an ocean in emergency. Additionally, some of the books that you own might make a lot more sense now that you know a thing or two about how the earth and the sky relate to each other. For instance, two of my favorites are The Barefoot Navigator by Jack Lagan and Emergency Navigation by David Birch. These two books talk a lot about ancient navigation techniques. For instance, knowing that the star Arcturus has a declination of 19 degrees north and knowing that the Hawaiian Islands can be found at 19 degrees north should be apparent to you that you can find yourself in the middle of the ocean, sail to a spot directly beneath Arcturus, turn east to west and find your way to Hawaii. Pretty impressive. Now there's no doubt about it, celestial navigation is a tough nut to crack. But I liken it to learning a language or an instrument. With dedication and practice, eventually you'll look back and wonder what the big deal was. Moving forward, there's a couple ways we can do this. We can get deep into the mathematics and solve all the problems manually, or we can use pre-computed strip forms and just plug in values. What I hope to do is steer a middle ground, talk a little bit about the theory, but focus mostly on results. Only then, once you have a knowledge of the process, can you expand into the fields that interest you the most. The core of what we're going to do boils down to triangles. If you think back to your school days, you might remember that if you know three parts of a triangle, whether it's sides or angles, you can figure out all the rest using the law of sines and cosines. This iPad app shows an example. Unfortunately, our triangles are not traditional triangles. We'll be drawing triangles on the surface of the Earth, and therefore we'll be using spherical triangles. But fear not, there's an app that solves for those as well. And as a bonus, if you ever want to impress somebody, you can just tell them that you're doing a little bit of spherical trigonometry. But a triangle is a triangle, even if it's drawn on the surface of a globe. And the idea is to just take what we know and solve for the rest. So what do we know? We know how to find the geographic position of a body. We'll call that GP. That's one point of our triangle. Looking at the world, another point should be readily apparent, and that's the North Pole or the elevated pole, depending on which hemisphere you're in. We'll call that EP for elevated pole. If we draw a line between them, it's the opposite of declination. It's called co-declination, but it doesn't really matter. What matters is we have one side of the triangle. So what else do we know? We also know approximately where we are. It's our DR position or someplace close. We'll call that AP for assumed position. It doesn't have to be exactly where we are, and we'll learn more about this later. But if we connect all the dots, 
what we have is a spherical triangle with three points. So we already said we we're able to determine one side. We actually know another. The distance from GP to AP is our zenith distance. And we know how to calculate that. So we're getting closer. So what else do we know? We know that GP is determined by Greenwich hour angle, but we're not using the Greenwich meridian. But we did learn how to relate Greenwich to our position, to geographic position, and that's through LHA. And that's our mystery angle. Now we can solve this triangle using the apps. How does the iPad app actually work? Well, if we dig a little bit into the math, we learn that it uses the law of sines and cosines to determine missing angles and sides of triangles in plane geometry. But again, we're not using plane geometry. We're using spherical geometry. Luckily, though, the law of cosines and sines for spherical triangles is not that much different. And honestly, it doesn't even matter because our apps solve them for us. HO229 is built to solve spherical triangles. There's other apps out there like the Air Almanac Tables or computer programs, but we'll focus on Pub229 in this series. Just like the Nautical Almanac though, it only comes in discrete numbers, so we're gonna have to interpolate. But the trick, just like any machine, is asking the right questions. We'll learn more about that in the next episode. When HO229 solves a triangle for you, it will tell you what the height of an object above the horizon should have been if you were actually standing at the assumed position. We knew all along that the AP was just a good guess of where you were. You're actually either closer or further away from the sun than the actual assumed position. So what you do is compare the calculated height to a measured height. Your measured height will be less or greater than the computed figure, which correlates directly to how much closer or further away from the AP you are. Instead of giving you a circle of equal altitude half the size of the Earth, the difference between the two measurements can be plotted easily on a large-scale chart, giving you, for all intents and purposes, a nearly straight line of position. For now, let's wrap up with a look at the whole process for determining a celestial LAP. Step one is to measure an object in the sky and correct it using all standard corrections. We know how to do that, that's no problem. Step two is to find the geographic position of a body using the nautical almanac. Again, that's no problem. Step three is to build a triangle using the geographic position, the elevated pole, and a carefully selected assumed position, which we'll learn more about, so don't worry about that for now. Step four is to solve the triangle using HO229, or the site reduction tables. And step five is to compare the height that you measured to the height that you determined in the book, plot the difference, and that's your celestial line of position. That's all there is to it. Of course, there's going to be tons of complicating factors along the way, but we'll work through those as we come to them. For now, chew on that, refer to the notes below, and when you're ready, we'll move on.